which is always a, a big accomplishment. Good. So, uh, great. If anyone has any questions before we start, uh, please Q&A, and you can also during the uh, presentation uh, ask any question. And uh, let's uh, let's get going. So, um, second. Okay. So. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction about Startup Blink. Startup Blink is a global startup ecosystem map and a research, a research uh, center. Uh, as you can see, a giant map of startups. Everyone can register for free. You're also going to support the ranking of your city and country if you do. So uh, I'm addressing the patriotic people here uh, to, to register. Uh, the map is well known. We have uh, uh, tens of thousands of people that are registered, about uh, a reach of more than 50,000 entrepreneurs and the uh, people that are part in our meetup communities around the world. Uh, lots of press coverage, mainly for a report that we're launching on um, an annual basis. Uh, this report has a few global data partners like Crunchbase, Meetup, the UNAIDS, and uh, a lot, a lot of ecosystem partners from around the world, I think more than 50, mostly from the public sector. Um, and this report is basically ranking the startup ecosystems of 1,000 cities and 100 countries. So let me share a quick link with you in the chat. Actually, you can type it. It's at report.startuplink.com. You can download the report uh, whenever you want. So that's a little bit about uh, you know the things that uh, that we're up to. Uh, the rankings looks like that. What you can see here on the on the right side of the screen. Um, and there are 1,000 cities over so here. It's a very small sample from what you would see. If you go to startuplink.com, scroll below the map, you would see those ranking tables uh, as well with the momentum also of the startup ecosystems. So let's start with talking a little bit about uh, why do ecosystems matter uh, for entrepreneurs? So I know a lot of us today are actually entrepreneurs. I'm surprised to see a, a nice number of you. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why should you care about your startup ecosystem. So I want to start with a, with a quick um, reality check, let's say, about unicorns. So the unicorns are the startups that are worth more than $1 billion. When you actually do an investigation about where the unicorns are from, you would be surprised or not surprised to see that most of them are coming from those locations that I put here on the list of the 14. The vast majority, we're talking about maybe 90% of them. It kind of makes you think, what's so special about those places? Are those places are with superhumans, extra talent and so on? Are people from Bangalore or, or Beijing or Boston or San Francisco much more intelligent than anyone else? How did this happen that 90% uh, of the uni unicorns in the world are in places that are basically 1% or 2% of the population of the world. And the reason is clear. There are network effects that really supplement and push ecosystems forward. Like the more an ecosystem is getting stronger, the more the network effect is even leveraging it more up. And we have to understand that this is a fact. And there is a reason why those phenomenon of unicorns is happening in specific hubs. The power of the of the hub and the network effect. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening in those hubs. Uh, what is happening in better ecosystems? Uh, so first of all, investors. Uh, it's very known by now that investors are, they like to be in specific places. And the minute that you persuade them with FOMO, fear of missing out, that something is happening in a place, only then they go and scout for deals in a specific place. And this is a phenomenon that is validated. So the idea is that we have to create the uh, fear of missing out for investors to kind of say, you know what, I'm putting Shanghai on the list now. I have to be there as well. So this is something that is happening. And again, most of them like to work in the same hubs. Uh, clients. There are certain clients, very innovative uh, clients that are not risk averse and that are understanding the vast opportunities uh, by taking a risk and working with a startup, uh, they are usually in those hubs. Why? Because there is some kind of a psychological effect in those hubs that is very pro-innovation. Um, other than that, co-founders, team members, suppliers, all of them are on, on in those hubs as well. You're much more likely to go to an ecosystem of people that are not interested in a nine to five, 
but are interested in building a massive startup, you're much more likely to find their, your co-founder co and your team members and also an amazing supplier that can give you services. Um, so what can we do? If you stay in a small town that has almost no activity, your possibilities of finding people around you that will boost your startup are relatively limited in comparison. In those uh, hubs, you will also have knowledge base, lots of events. There is cutting edge knowledge um, that is updated uh, with the latest, uh, let's say, best practices. So that's one more reason that those, those places are excelling. Those places where you actually go there and you see um, meetups every day of four or five different events. So this is something that is uh, interesting. And again, today we're in a very interesting period with the, with the COVID-19 that uh, this effect is actually diminishing a little bit. So if the situation stays the same way, and it's probably not going to stay the same way, we're going to see those network effects diluting. But the con consensus is that it's not going to stay this way. And those hubs are going to break through again when we're out of this uh, current weird period. Uh, one more thing that is uh, in those hubs is mindset uh, and culture that supports entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship is very lonely. It can get very, um, let's say, discouraging. If you're in a small town by yourself if, and your family is telling you, what are you doing? Why don't you get a job and your friends don't get it? Uh, you're emotionally very much more, uh, let's say, uh, probably uh, gonna quit than if you're in a city surrounded by people with dreams that are basically building their dream together with you. So um, that's basically the idea. Uh, those are the ranking tables and you can see over here, San Francisco is way, way, way in the top. However, I do wanna say a word of uh, warning, not everyone should be in San Francisco. Uh, the ecosystem that you choose has to do with your life circumstances. For example, some of us must stay in Europe or in Asia. That's basically our place. So uh, the idea is from having a ranking of 1,000 ecosystems, you can actually choose which place is better for me, for you with your selection in a way. Uh, it has to fit your goals. So if you would go to San Francisco, you want to change the world and you're, you're willing to, to pay big prices on accommodation and everything to do that. If you have a little bit less uh, interested, let's say interested in building the next Facebook, San Francisco is probably not for you. And then the only thing you want to ch check is that you choose a vibrant enough ecosystem that would uh, have good quality of life, a good cost of living, a place that you like, but also good activity. But it doesn't have to be one of the top uh, 20 or even 100, as long as there is some kind of signs of life, something is happening. Um, some of you will also have to pick a, an ecosystem based on the vertical. So let's say if you're doing hardware, maybe Shenzhen is going to be great for you in, in China, although the for other verticals, it would be much, uh, much not so good. Singapore would be great for, uh, for fintech, for example. So the idea is to also, uh, let's say, um, uh, see what is your vertical. And according to that, try to understand uh, what would be the best ecosystem in this vertical. In Startup Link, we also have vertical rankings currently for uh, uh, fintech and COVID-19 innovation. Um, so you can ch check it on the website and uh, kind of like figure out according to your vertical, where should you be? And I'll just say that uh, the conclusion or the bottom line of this uh, thing is that uh, if you are in an underperforming ecosystem where not a lot is happening, we recommend to either um, leave it and just relocate, upgrade to something better. Again, it doesn't have to be San Francisco, but to something a little bit better or lead it. And by leading it, I mean that uh, uh, you become a lot more active. And I see that we have a few private ecosystem developers here that are much more active uh, in building their ecosystem and supporting their ecosystems as well. So that's a little bit of, um, of an intro about that. I'll just tell you that uh, for the countries, and over here you can see actually the country ranking. So in Startup Link, we're also ranking 100 countries. Uh, ecosystems are actually making a giant difference for the economy of countries as well when it's done correctly. So first of all, they're creating high quality jobs and those jobs are generating a lot of taxes for the country. Uh, the, the exits are also generating great windfall of money from those exits for the country that can later be used for infrastructure, for education and so on. 
Uh, good ecosystems are also attracting investors and entrepreneurs. That's important to say. When someone understands that an ecosystem is great, um, you're going to see like bees attracted to honey, uh, that everyone wants to be there. Uh, the most important thing, I think, for countries is to avoid the brain drain. So over here, because the world is becoming more global, uh, people can now make uh, choices about where do they go to. So if you have a good startup ecosystem, that's one of the best things that you can do to keep your uh, talent. And uh, one more thing that the good ecosystem um, is doing, and that's uh, the last thing we're going to talk about before we jump to the quick introduction of case studies, uh, uh, starting with, with Sofia, is uh, to improve the country image and its strategic and geopolitical situation. Uh, for example, I'm from Israel, and I can tell you that uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was uh, not as, as, uh, as easy uh, to introduce yourself in, as a, someone from Israel. And now, uh, because of the success of the X system, because of the amazing accomplishment of the country, of the X system, uh, of the X system in general, the country has greatly benefited, both on the image um, and also on the strategic uh, ability to form connections and alliances with other countries. So the idea is that if you um, want to strengthen the position of your country in general, technology is one of the most efficient ways uh, to do so. So, yeah. So good, now we're gonna do a quick um, jump to a, a very brief uh, uh, ecosystem case study. So we're in those webinars, we're always trying to kind of like uh, get to know a little bit, few ecosystems from around the world. And today, uh, I think we're going to start with the, I have to check who is in, who is in the queue, but uh, we're going to start with the, with Anna from, from, uh, from Invest in Sofia. Uh, so uh, that's, that's something that uh, Bulgaria is in, uh, an amazing country and uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I traveled there extensively. So Anna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you to a panelist. Let's see if it works. And as I'm promoting you, I'm also going to share with people maybe um, the position of, uh, of uh, Bulgaria in the last report and of Sofia uh, as well. So, hey, Anna, can you hear me? Hello, Ali. I can hear you. How good. are you? It's great to see you. Same thing. Great as well. Uh, we actually, I don't think your, your camera is working. I don't know if you have an icon to... I do, okay. and I'm trying to start it, but it says that you have stopped it. The oh, wow. That's it. very interesting. I did it. <laughs> Let me check. Maybe I can... Uh... Zoom lives. Yes, I'll try to re... I think what I can do... Wow, I don't know, actually. Interesting. Technical things. Who can all share right. all panelists? But yeah, maybe we can. So maybe you can now try again. But if it doesn't work, we'll just go with audio. And uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm trying good. with the camera for the last time. Good. Unfortunately, not doesn't working. Work. No worries. So uh, we'll just uh, do an audio. And uh, let me ask you, Anna. I spent a lot of time in in, uh, in Sofia and Beta House. I was doing work. Oh. Yeah, it's one of my favorite, definitely my favorite locations. And I was always surprised by how the ecosystem is actually um, overperforming uh, compared mm -hmm. to ecosystems in the region. I'm just going to share with everyone uh, for a second um, the ranking of, uh, of, the, uh, of the ecosystem in, uh, in uh, Bulgaria. I think that in, this, mm -hmm. in, in 2020, we had really nice results. And I'm just going to share it with everyone here just a second. So if we look at the ecosystem of the of Sofia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you're currently ranked at number 84, I think. 86. 86, 86 sorry. Right, right there in the top 100. And it's very interesting uh, because we see that you're ranked uh, above ecosystems like uh, like Budapest and uh, and uh, Bangkok and Baltimore and Rio de Janeiro. So. Uh, Calgary and uh, a lot of others. So very interesting for us to kind of figure out what's your uh, maybe secret of, uh, of success of uh, creating a situation where uh, the Sofia startup ecosystem is actually in the top 100. So I was kind of wondering mm -hmm. from your side, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what exactly happened there. How did this happen? 
I will try to tell our story in a nutshell. First of all, hello, everybody. Hello, Ellie, once again. It's a pleasure to be here, and we are very glad that we also had the opportunity to collaborate with Startup Blink uh, for this year's report, and we are very glad that uh, Sophia's position has improved this year. Um, Let's, let me try to give you a short overview of what happened. And I really hope that Yali uh, will be able to come to Sofia and everybody here and to see for themselves how the ecosystem is changing, of course, after the whole unpleasant situation with COVID-19 has come to pass, hopefully soon. So uh, Sofia has one of the most rapidly developing startup and entrepreneurial ecosystems in Europe and in Central Europe. Uh, I'm part of the team of Innovative Sofia, which is the digitalization, innovation and economic development department of Sofia municipality. So our mission is to support Sofia's development as a tech innovation and a creative hub and also to make sure that more and more people from all around the world know about how Sophie is developing and what kind of entrepreneurial story uh, the city has. So many IT companies here develop products and conduct R&D activities and Sophie based companies and startups are more and more often developing global solutions locally. So in the past, Sofia was more known as an outsourcing destination, but it has come a long way so far, and now is actually a creator of high quality global solutions and a partner of innovation to businesses all across the world. So uh, the development of Sofia's ecosystem started in 2012, 2013, and in the last seven, eight years, over 2,000 startups have been created in Bulgaria and mainly in Sofia. Just uh, a small note here, Sofia is the capital and the economic heart of Sofia, uh, of Bulgaria. So around 40% of the GDP is located here in uh, the city and most of the investments also come here. Uh, Sofia has a very, very well developed ICT sector and actually around 80% of the whole ICT industry in Bulgaria is located here in the city, which is an innovation and tech driver. So currently, there are around 650, maybe 700 active startups and scale-ups, again, mainly located in Sofia. And a curious fact is that around one third of the founders are foreigners and around one fifth of all founders are women. And we believe that even more than 20% are women. Uh, Sofia hasn't had its first unicorn yet, but there are several companies that we believe are on the right track and we really hope that we'll have our unicorn for the next edition of Startup Blinks report. Um, meanwhile, in the last couple of years, we have uh, had a very rapidly developing VC and angel investors network and community. Currently, there are over 15 different VC funds, uh, which are supporting uh, startups on of various stages, starting from pre-seed, seed, and scaling on various kind of verticals. So uh, there is also a big uh, network of angel investors, which is increasing in the last year. And also there are some foreigners in these networks as well. We also have over 30 co-working spaces and growing. Uh, also over 30 IT and innovation academies in addition to the universities and various schools here in the cities. Uh, first time entrepreneurs can also resort to local incubators and accelerator and pre-accelerator programs to get the support and the guidance they need. And also Sofia has uh, a very big uh, tech Park, Sofia Tech Park, which is the first science and technology park here in Bulgaria, which will host one of the EU's eight next generation supercomputers next year. So we are very, very happy about this development. Uh, if we speak in more detail about the verticals, it's a curious fact that around 15% of Sofia's uh, startups are in deep tech. Uh, meaning artificial intelligence, fintech, cybersecurity, biotech, createch, robotics and automation, and even aerospace. 
So there are over 60 fintech startups and actually Sophie is one of the most rapidly developing fintech hubs in Central and Eastern Europe, over 30 in artificial intelligence and even over 35 in gaming which is something curious about Safia. Me as a game lover myself, I'm very, very happy about this development. So when we speak about the ecosystem, we have a very wide, but in the same time, united ecosystem. So there are cities where there is a big uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems, but it's divided into smaller sub system, let's say. So a small entrepreneurial system of startups working in FinTech, of or createch or biotech. Here in Sofia, all of these ecosystems communicate with each other and not only with and among each other, but also with various associations, foundations, clusters. That's another interesting trend developing here in Sofia uh, with municipal and government organizations. So everyone is working together in order to achieve this common goal and to develop more and more solutions. Also, more and more people are returning to Sofia. So the brain drain is starting to reverse. Me, myself, I studied abroad for over five years and then returned to Sofia because I knew that there were some great opportunities to find an exciting work here and to be able to make a difference and to work for an impact. And that's also one of the reasons why I joined the team of Innovative Sofia. Furthermore, in addition to having these uh, opportunities for professional development, Sofia can offer a very, very good quality of life. Maybe you know that we have mountains just 30 minutes away from here, the beautiful Vitusha mountain. Uh, Sofia is very green, there are parks everywhere. So one day when I start a family, uh, it will be a nice place to also raise my children and have uh, a quite relaxed uh, lifestyle in a way. So exciting at work and relaxed at home. Uh, last but not least, I would like to speak about the tech talent here in Sofia. So uh, we have over 100,000 graduates in STEM fields every year and over 50% of population have um, university degree. Around 90% of the population aged uh, between 18 and 45 speak English, which is also a big benefit. And Sofia actually ranks uh, 28th among 400 cities and regions around the world in English proficiency. So when you come and visit us, hopefully soon, uh, you won't have a problem with the communication and the language barrier as well. So that's uh, Sophia's story in a very, very small nutshell. So I'll be happy to answer any of your questions or give you any additional details. Also my LinkedIn profile is uh, in the chat. So I'm looking forward to meeting new people. Thank you. Yeah, Anna, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, if anyone is interested in moving their company to, to Sofia, uh, talk with Anna. Uh, I, I was there about, uh, oh, it was three years ago and I really enjoyed it. I actually really enjoyed also Varna, that is the second ranked uh, city in uh, Bulgaria. Although, uh, Anna, you can see a very big difference, right? Uh, Sofia is number 86, Varna is 430. And Plovdiv, yeah. also one of my favorite cities, the, the historic, probably the most uh, historic city in, in Europe, uh, is number 784. So I see that there are also other options in, uh, in Bulgaria as well, right? Uh, yeah. Other ecosystems that are growing uh, relatively, relatively fast. So oh, it looks amazing. Uh, do you have any connection with the other startup ecosystem in Bulgaria? Any, any insights about why, why the gaps are so big and... Uh, if the momentum is um, like, well, what do you think is is one one other? If you had to choose one other city other than Sofia that you're betting on in in Bulgaria, which one would it be? Oh, it wouldn't be only one city, <laughs> definitely. Uh, we as uh, um, 
innovative Sofia, we're focusing and concentrating on Sofia, but it doesn't mean that other centers and entrepreneurial hubs are not developing in the city. Of course, Varna and Burgas that you mentioned, they're also close to the seaside. So we have our mountains and they have their sea. Plovdiv, also another uh, city, uh, Veliku Tarnovo, which used to be uh, actually Bulgaria's capital 200 years ago. Uh, is also developing as a hub. And after COVID-19, we uh, started to see this interesting tendency for more and more entrepreneurs leaving uh, their offices here in Sofia, but going to other cities and preferring to uh, work remotely from there because they have the opportunity to do so. So again, uh, communications and this opportunity for to work from basically anywhere in the world and connect uh, to people from everywhere is also a big plus. So maybe there will be an even bigger spread of uh, entrepreneurial activity in different cities in Bulgaria too. But for now, Sofia, Sofia remains the biggest hub so far. Okay. Thanks a lot, Anna, and see you in Sofia soon, hopefully. Uh, so, so great, uh, great having you with us and uh, good luck. Continue the success that you have so far. Thank you. Uh, good. So I think that what we're going to do now, we're going to go back to the presentation and uh, uh, talk a little bit about what the private and public sector can do. And then when we're done with the, with the next slides, I think we're still going to have time. Uh, to present one or two more ecosystems, but it has to be spontaneously. So um, if anyone here, especially from the public sector or an ecosystem developer wants to give a, a, two, a two minute speech about their startup ecosystem, uh, let us know, in, let me know in the Q&A that, uh, that you would like to, um, to pitch and let us know from which organization you are. And we're hopefully going to have about one or two minutes uh, for each one of you to kind of like do a quick pitch of the ecosystem uh, because we have to keep on pitching, you know, we're in the entrepreneurship business. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, continue the, the slides a little bit and kind of like try to figure out. Um, uh, yeah, and, and actually, Anna, I know that you 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 asked me a question before about the um, what what would be the changes of COVID nineteen that are affecting ecosystems. I honestly believe that. Um, uh, so, so your question in the chat. I honestly believe that they're not going to change because, in the end of the day, people are attracted to uh, success stories and to hubs where, uh, especially investors, they're very much funding uh, entrepreneurs on um, that in in places where they were successful. So entrepreneurs are going to keep on just by the value of the story, probably stick with the hubs. And COVID nineteen might even make the situation worse because it would not allow the upcoming cities to really uh, uh, push through because there are no more network effects. So the, the investors are more likely, if the situation continues, uh, to actually take continue taking bets on what worked in the past. So I actually think that um, this current period, if it doesn't end soon, will actually only widen the gap between the big startup ecosystems and the small ones. Uh, so let's hope uh, someone, some uh, talented entrepreneurs is going to find a vaccine already. And, uh, and uh, so we can move on to, to uh, building ecosystems. Uh, although there is great amount of innovation currently as well. So we're very, very happy to see uh, that happening uh, also in this uh, era. And let me just jump to where we, um, the last uh, slide that, uh, that we did is uh, uh, about uh, um, problems, common problems in the startup ecosystem. So Startup Link is working with a lot of ecosystem developers. And we, have, we identified a few things that keep on repeating in ecosystems that are uh, underperforming in a way. So let me just share a few of them with you. And again, by the way, just to prepare for the, um, for, uh, um, the, uh, the end, if, you're, if you want to pitch one or two minutes your startup ecosystem, basically answering a question, why is it worthwhile for people to arrive to your city? Uh, what, what's so exciting about it? Uh, let me know in the Q and A, and we're gonna gonna allow pitches of one or two minutes in the end. Uh, so if anyone is brave and spontaneous and patriotic and want to pitch their ecosystem, you're welcome. So a little bit about common problems in the underdeveloped startup ecosystems that are not working that well. Uh, first of all, the biggest problem that we've identified is, you know, when when we're trying to think about who is to blame for a bad ecosystem, many people will tell you 
it's the public sector, uh, it's the government and so on. What we've discovered is that there is a thing that connects all the good startup ecosystem, which is the following, uh, the mentality of the local population. So if the local population is interested in being an entrepreneur and building something and not doing the nine to five and not working for other people, it doesn't really matter how good the government policies are or how bad they are, that's going to be a great ecosystem. An example for that would probably be Israel that has so-so public sector. I wouldn't say that, uh, that this is the best example of, of, uh, of policies and so on, but the ecosystem is booming because the mindset is there. The private sector is very not risk averse, is interested in taking risk and building things. Um, one more thing that is uh, uh, impeding a little bit the development of ecosystems is uh, the image of successful entrepreneurs. So in the good ecosystems, successful entrepreneurs are celebrated. The Elon Musks, you know, all those people that are, everyone is admiring. In some countries, especially countries that used to be uh, communist uh, in the past, there is a notion of a little bit like um, a, a entrepreneur by, by the name itself is not a negative, is not a positive thing. Uh, and this is a, a misconception that everyone is trying to change now, but sometimes it sticks in people's minds that maybe, you know, entrepreneurship is a little bit like manipulation or something like that. And we've identified this in various countries where people are kind of a little bit even know that uh, if they go there and they're successful, people are not going to celebrate them, but actually going to try to understand how did they manipulate the system. So this is, again, a lot of it has to do with the psychology of the private sector, of the uh, uh, people themselves. Uh, one more thing that we see in ecosystems that are not doing that well is lack of trust. So the idea is that if uh, there is a mentality uh, of not trusting that much other people in the ecosystem, you can't really have co-founders because who's going to sign an, an agreement about equity when there is a lack of trust? You will not share your ideas. So you would have a lot of stealth mode uh, ideas in ecosystems like that, that everyone is like, I'm not talking about my uh, startup until he signed an NDA and so on. Those are things that are not happening in good ecosystems usually. Uh, so the lack of trust is really also influencing the flow of information as well. One more problem in uh, under uh, developed startup ecosystem would be lack of capital. We're talking about investors that we talked about before. They like to be in the successful places. You will not change their mind. They're after return on the uh, return of invest of uh, investment, and that is happening by copying the past. So in uh, ecosystems that are not known, um, you have lack of capital because investors are not there. The banks are not willing to give loans and credit, and also. Uh, and this is the most important one, people have less self-funding options. So usually startups are starting with people investing their own money. So if anyone thinks that the, the story is usually a big venture capital is putting the money and everything, no, it's not, it's not the case. In the beginning, the, the co-founder itself, the, the, the person that started a startup, has to put their own money, at least initially, to have a little bit of skin in the game. And uh, in those, in those uh, uh, locations, maybe there is not enough even savings to even do a mild investment. Um, one more thing that is hurting those ecosystems is lack of government support. If the government is totally not interested, that's also a problem. Um, and there are a few locations still in the world where the government and the municipalities and so on simply don't give, give a damn about how the uh, ecosystem is evolving. Those places are quickly decreasing. You see less and less. Everyone understands that entrepreneurship is the new oil and everyone is waking up. Uh, in some places, much, much better than other. You will see places with much more active public sector, uh, much more supporting start, uh, public sector, and this is very important. The biggest enemy of entrepreneurship is the next bullet, bureaucracy. So the idea is that I've seen a few ecosystems, uh, not naming names, uh, that uh, are very problematic on bureaucracy. They would, they would kill you uh, to if you want to start a business. Basically, you have to file a lot of documents. You have to prove that you're doing something that is legal. You have to wait for authorization and so on. So the idea is that bureaucracy is absolutely um, a pain. That uh, entrepreneurs are currently dealing with so many uncertainties in their own startups. That dealing also with uncertainties that are pushed to you by the public sector. It's a little bit too much. Interestingly, uh, there are a few, uh, this is the most interesting, much government support. You would see this in places, mostly in Scandinavia. 
what is happening there is that the government and the public sector is actually giving so much support that they're creating uh, drug addicts. There's no other way of saying that. So the idea is that they're taking everyone by the hand and helping them with everything, that it's so much that it, it basically um, makes the ecosystem toxic. And we've seen this in a few countries, uh, for example, uh, Denmark, a little bit in Norway. So um, in some countries, you have serious problems of over support by the government to a level that, um, you know, it's, it's becoming a little bit too much and creating damage. Uh, other problems that we identified is slow or ex expensive internet. Uh, that, that's on the infrastructure, not enough co-working spaces. Um, you know, that people can't meet and work somewhere, uh, have to stay at home and not enough accelerators. So those things are also hurting ecosystems. Um, one more problem would be lack of success stories and influencers. The more time is passing and we're doing ecosystem development and consulting in Startup Link, we understand that stories is a massive ingredient of a, of a successful startup ecosystem. What the psychology of people of identifying a good startup ecosystem is critical. And you do that with celebrating success. And this is not happening in many, many locations where you don't even have one person to look up to and not even have any good news about the ecosystem at all. So this is really not good. You want to be constantly celebrating. Um, and uh, in some places, surprisingly, uh, their, the low cost of living is also influencing the success of the ecosystem because you might rather be a freelancer for someone in uh, richer countries, make a lot of money, and not necessarily be an entrepreneur. On the flip side, high cost of living, like you can see in Norway or Sweden and so on, are also going to affect badly the ecosystem because starting and going out of the job circle has a lot of implications as well. So those are uh, it's a relatively long list of things that we've identified that are creating um, problems for the ecosystem. I'm just going to answer a quick question from Wile. And again, I'm apologizing to everyone. I can't track the chat, so I'm only answering things on the QA. Uh, so even if you want to feature, if you have questions in the, in the Q&A, please. Uh, Wile was asking, how will crowdfunding be integrated into existing ecosystems? Crowdfunding is a promise that um, unfortunately didn't really materialize. Uh, it's not going to be a major uh, channel of, um, of funding. Uh, it's a nice channel of funding, especially if it has to do with hardware and IoT. But unfortunately, we can't really count on, hard, uh, on, uh, on crowdfunding. It's going to be mostly still uh, investors and more than anything, people's own money. And their own line of credit. So this is a, this is currently the what what we're what we're identifying on this. Um, and let me just uh, quickly um, go over to the next slide, which would be: um, Should private uh, sector organizations and individuals promote their ecosystem? So I know that we have a lot of private sector ecosystem uh, developers uh, over here, and I have to say I'm I'm uh, I'm really inspired by you because it's not really your responsibility to um, develop your own ecosystem. Uh, and I'm really also inspired by public sector uh, people that are so energetic and are doing whatever they can with a lot of motivation. Um, but for the private sector, it's not really your responsibility, but it is worthwhile to uh, try to grow your startup ecosystem. And uh, why is it worthwhile? So personally, on the personal level, what we've discovered is that um, Becoming an ecosystem connector uh, increases your network leverage and your, uh, for your own project. So we've actually identified a few people already that just by doing so much for their ecosystem, their project uh, uh, leverage has greatly increased. So that's something to, to consider. Uh, when you give, good things are happening in general. Um, and the second thing is what we mentioned before. If your ecosystem is a failure, and the public sector is not really in the game and still doesn't care that much about your ecosystem, uh, you basically should leave and relocate to another ecosystem. But if you really love your location, it makes total sense of not staying passive in a losing location, but becoming active in a losing location and trying to make it at least more uh, successful. So let's just um, talk a little bit about how can you help as a private uh, sector organization or an individual to help your local startup ecosystem grow. So there are a few ways of doing that. The first thing you would uh, be recommended to do is to organize and attend meetups. Now, very difficult. Again, COVID-19 is gonna have 
I'm, I'm honestly not that optimistic about this period on the amount of innovation that it will create. From one side, I'm optimistic because I think a lot of people are out of the job uh, circle and they will start startups. So I, would say, I, I expect to actually see a surge of innovation uh, because of that. We're going to see the people that always had an excuse about why they don't want to start a startup, why they can't, now they can. So there is going to be a good, um, good impact here, but there's also going to be a bad impact. The bad impact is the ability of people to connect to each other and start relationships that are critical, for example, co-founding relationship, because it's very, very difficult to find a co-founder on online. Uh, humans are not geared into making big decisions about marriage and about co-founding, uh, which is practically almost the same, uh, uh, online. So we're going to see a little bit of a lack here, and that's why we recommend people to keep, if you can meet people, try to meet people, and if not, at least try be very open-minded when you do this online, because the magic is happening when people are meeting. Um, so uh, one thing you can do to increase you know, the growth of the startup ecosystem is just to create a meetup, a networking event. The other thing you can do is uh, make valuable connections whenever possible, and that means be a connector. If you see someone that needs someone, uh, something, and you see another person that can supply that thing, connect. Always think about how do you connect people. And this is critical. From those connections, amazing things are happening. So change your mindset and try to be a connector. Keep on connecting people. Um, the mentality change that we recommend, because this could be a little bit of uh, work that you would never know, why does it make sense for you to invest so much effort, is the give first. Just like Brad Feld is always preaching, uh, when you give first, um, good things will happen to you. And the one more thing that you can do is also mentor. If you see a startup, give them advice, uh, follow, them, follow up with them along the way. That's going to be greatly appreciated. Uh, I do want to say that Startlink has a program for uh, city, uh, city partners from the, public, uh, from the private sector. Uh, and that, uh, that, uh, that program also has, to, uh, also has to do with meetup and, and promoting your own, own organization. You can see that at, at citypartner.startuplink.com. And now we're going to move to the public sector, which is, might be even more, um, more interesting uh, in a way of, uh, of, uh, because the resources are, are basically, uh, basically there. Uh, I will answer a quick question from uh, RW, uh, and they, they're saying that they worked in a startup ex, uh, on startup ecosystem development for the last 20 years, mostly in the US and Eastern Europe. And for their experience, it's very difficult to get an ecosystem moving unless there is a real sense of urgency, usually created by a social shock or economic shock, like the recession and so on, that pro produces a near-death experience. Uh, really interesting. I think, by the way, COVID-19 is going to really reshuffle the cards, uh, speaking about, uh, about that. Um, and uh, RW is, is asking, what, what's the best advice of actually moving an ecosystem without this uh, uh, traumatic experience of a recession and so on? So first of all, uh, maybe it's not needed because now we're in a period that actually things are changing and there are those uh, breaking points that ecosystems can now really win and make it or break it in a way. So that's why I'm really, when we communicate with our ecosystem developers, we told them, we always tell them now is the most amazing time you're most needed now because big shifts are happening now. And if you play right aggressively and uh, do the right moves, your ecosystem will grow. If you stay very defensive and say, what, what, a, what a traumatic experience or a period, we're not gonna do anything you're basically creating damage for your ecosystem for the next 20 years to come. Because just, to, just like you said, RW, um, uh, those are the breaking points where you can get most leverage. As for the regular period, the only thing that I would recommend is to identify small success stories and to celebrate them. So if you see someone that got even an investment of $500,000 and so on in a smaller ecosystem, let everyone know celebrate success story of an ecosystem growing up the rankings of having more, more I don't know, more milestones and so on and so on. And just by creating the, the flow of good news, really good things are happening. But definitely this is a very interesting time to get a boost uh, for the next 20 years to come. So I'm hoping a lot of, uh, a lot of people are gonna take advantage of this. Um, and by the way, if you wanna pitch your ecosystem, please let me know from which organization you are 
So we just uh, so I just have a little bit more context. So uh, all of you that want to pitch uh, in the Q and A, please tell me uh, what are you working on, what, what organization you're working on. Let's move now to um, a little bit about the public sector. Uh, public sector policies are critical for ecosystem success. Uh, if the government policies are creating uncertainty, fear, and we've seen that, we've seen a lot of scared entrepreneurs that are scared from the government, uh, or confusions, uh, confusion about how to start a company or what exactly to do and what is the bureaucracy, it's over. Because as I mentioned before, it's so difficult to build a startup that if the environment is getting you in trouble as well, you're crazy to stay in an ecosystem like that. And there are some ecosystems like that. And the, by the way, they're growing uh, lower in number because now the public sector in those countries understood that they can no longer do that. So uh, there is now a transformation of being very business friendly, but some countries are going to the opposite direction. So uh, choose, choose right uh, where, where you are. And we talked about the over bureaucracy. It's important for uh, the public sector to be obsessed about making life easy for entrepreneurs, easy. Uh, I can't stress it enough. Uh, into matter of minutes to register a company, to incorporate, to report financials, uh, not to give fines. This is something we've seen in a few countries, giving fines to entrepreneurs on not filling out the right forms and whatever. And one thing that is also important that is a problem in places like West Europe, for example, is a flexible job market that you hire someone and it's very difficult to say goodbye. And for startups, that's absolutely um, a, a dreadful reality because startups are, they keep on changing so fast that if you have employment rules and so on for startups uh, that you that keep you uh, in a, not, not able to do quick changes in your startup, then there is no reason to stay in a place like that. And that's usually happening in West Europe. A geopolitical situation. Do remember that the geopolitical situation of your country will influence your startup ecosystem. So for example, if you're doing things that create tension or has uh, or create even sanctions and so on, your ecosystem is great, you're gonna suffer. Your entrepreneurs will not be able to travel, visa situation we're gonna complicate and so on and so on. However, I have to say it can be mitigated uh, that in some places that have not favorable geopolitical situation, uh, still the ecosystem are blossoming because the country is doing its best to mitigate. Some example to that, Israel, uh, Rwanda, Colombia, Three countries with interesting stories, challenging stories as well, challenging history as well. They are doing really good, really well lately because basically they just came to peace with where, where the, the situation is and are trying to mitigate those risks. Uh, one more problem that uh, in public sector policy, and we mentioned this before, is micromanaging an ecosystem. And uh, we talked about this in Scandinavia case, the ability of being like the a catcher in the rye field, that you have to save everyone, that there is, uh, there has to be uh, equally opportunity and uh, like uh, everyone should get their chance and if not, you have to support them and so on and so on. Uh, it creates a mentality um, within the local entrepreneurs that the government is going to help me. And if I'm not successful, it's the government that is doing, that uh, is actually failing and not me. And we've seen that in a few ecosystems, it's uh, heartbreaking to, to see it, to, to be honest. Like it's heartbreaking to see how Governments can actually create a situation that they are uh, 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 hugging their, their entrepreneurs so much that they're actually strangling them. So it's pretty interesting to see it and uh, it's an interesting phenomena. Uh, we also saw a few governments that pour so much money into the ecosystem as investors that they basically uh, create a toxic environment where the private sector investors are leaving the ecosystem because the government is pouring so much money and actually creating so much damage for the ecosystem. A good example with that, for that would be Poland, that is uh, uh, with the best intentions in the world, is creating a situation where so much money is circle, uh, circulated in the ecosystem that uh, you have a lot of zombie startups that are basically dependent on public sector funding. You don't want to be that. Um, so the conclusion for this slide is basically if the government has to choose only one activity to support its local ecosystem, it should basically do the following and remove roadblocks. Instead of being micromanaging an ecosystem, just be stay a little bit out of the way and remove the, the roadblocks so entrepreneurs can push forward. And that's maybe the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, let's say, lesson, uh, lesson out there. Um, good, so um, let's see. So 
we went over this slide. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how governments, what governments can do uh, very briefly. Uh, and by the way, I want to apologize because I thought this would take less time. And uh, so we're not going to have time for the presentation because I want to finish uh, more or less almost at the uh, round hour. So we're going to give opportunity for people to do uh, ecosystem pitching uh, in another event. We're plan. Uh, a little bit about why govern what government should do. The first thing you should do is invest in the promotion of your startup ecosystem. I want to stress this. The story element, what we think about the location is critical. People are going to locations because of their branding. So the government should always, always push and promote their local startup ecosystem, uh, both globally, but more than anything nationally. So the local entrepreneurs know that they're better off staying and that good things are happening in the ecosystem. Uh, one more thing that you want to do as a government is to push and create more co-working spaces and accelerators as well. So that's something that if they don't exist in your ecosystem, if you have dozens of them, like, like we have in Sofia, no need. Uh, the market is working perfectly. But if you don't have even one or you have only one and it's remote, try to create more and make them free. You need those magical locations where people are meeting each other. Uh, one more thing that you want to do is to understand the ecosystem and to share knowledge. You don't want to be in an ecosystem when no one is knowing who is doing what. That's why in Startup Link, one of the things that we're doing is mapping ecosystems and giving ecosystem uh, developers the ability to map their ecosystem and share who is doing what, while we're also promoting extensively, because those things are, are on the macro level, critical for the success. And one more thing you want to do is kind of a deep analysis to really understand what's going on. What are the trends? You know, not doing things without measuring them, but doing things and analyzing them and talking with as many people as possible to get their feedback about what's going on. I'll just say that Starling does have a, a, a program that supports the public sector in the promotion, the mapping, the consulting about their startup ecosystem. You can see it at ecosystempartnership.startuplink.com. And because we're very close to the end, I'll just say that one of the most important things to do is to communicate with your startup ecosystem. And uh, as a public sector, you want to speak with the entrepreneurs. You want to, uh, a lot of us are, you know, uh, not even taking the time to create constantly dozens of meetings with our entrepreneurs and kind of asking them, what's wrong? What could be better? What do you like? What's great? in a way. So when you do those interviews, you identify patterns and those patterns are absolutely going to be of great insights to you. You can understand what are the roadblocks. And again, as a public sector, you have to be totally connected with your entrepreneurs. Keep on speaking with them. Ask, to, ask yourself a question. How many startup founders from my ecosystem did I speak with in the last month? And if the answer is one or zero, um, it's something to do again. And I'm pretty sure that for most people, it's it's higher than that. Um, and I'll just say uh, to, to, um, to, to speak about the notion about success. Psychology is the key. You want to be in a situation that uh, everyone regards your ecosystem as a success story. So that means that in the beginning, celebrate success. And also, um, the way we look at it is that the public sector responsibility is to do a lot when the ecosystem is just starting. So think about it like a snowball. In order to create this snowball effect that it rolls and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, someone has to start the snowball. It's not going to start out of nothing. So the idea is that you have to start the initial one. And as you see it grow and grow, you let go and let the private sector take care of it because then there are going to be economic incentives to actually make this uh, happen. Uh, and again, celebrate success. Whenever you see success, share it with the world. This is psychologically super needed. Um, I'll just say that uh, on, on this, we, we have a few more uh, methods of, uh, of uh, supporting an ecosystem. I'll mention maybe one, one or two that are critical. Uh, one of them would be to also make sure that the other cities that are not the main hubs are not left behind and are also having a good ecosystem. A good ecosystem does not want to only count on one city. Uh, so in, in Bulgaria case, for example, we've seen four cities that are in the game, which is great. We see other countries where we, there is only one ecosystem in the top 100 and not even one ecosystem, other ecosystem in the top 1,000. That's not a, 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 good, a good thing. So you want diversity. You want a few ecosystems that are growing. And I'll just share with you that one of the things that does not have to do with ecosystem development, but we've seen as critical for the success of the ecosystem, and I think Anna talked about this, is level of English. 
level of English. If you have money and you're not sure about how to develop an X system, throw it to English um, uh, teachers in education. That's probably the thing that is going to bring you the most dividends in about uh, 20 years from now or even 10. So um, that's it for today. I want to thank everyone for arriving. Once again, I know that we have a few people that want to pitch their ecosystem, but we're out of time. So we're going to organize another event for specific ecosystem pitching. And that's basically it. If you need to connect, elliotstartuplink.com. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you for arriving. Enjoy your day. Develop your ecosystem. Build cool stuff. So see you soon. Bye-bye.